Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Adnan Sharif and I'm a consultant nephrologist at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. By nephrologist that means I look after people with kidney problems and the main focus of my work is looking after people who've had a kidney transplant. We're joined today by a patient who has experienced a very common problem that we often see for patients after they've had a kidney transplant and that's cytomegalovirus. And through talking about his experience and what he went through and how he was treated, what we're hoping to do is to raise awareness about cytomegalovirus, or CMV for short, show you how it's tested for and how it's treated, and to demonstrate that CMV is no longer the feared problem that it was before, but it's something that we want to make sure that our patients have some awareness about. That gives me pleasure to introduce our patient, Fezawan, who will give us a little introduction about himself and his journey that he's had with his kidney transplants Hi, nice to meet you too. My name is Feza Wan and I was born with um, kidney failure and throughout my lifetime I've had three kidney transplants, one at the age of three, then a live donor from my father at the age of 14 when I first experienced CMV um, as I was in paediatrics at the time and it wasn't as well known. Um, I was treated by being um, via IV antibiotics. Um, and I was kind of isolated as well at the time. Um, so that was my kind of first experience of it. Um, and then when I had my third kidney transplant, which was in July, 2020, um, fortunately the technology and the science had advanced and I was able to take a course of tablets, which I could do at home um, to treat the CMV I had. So I was wondering um, what's CMV infection and what CMV disease and what are the differences? So yeah, there's, I mean, there's lots of different terminology that is used and it's important to know what they all mean. So, um, I mean, I'll start with the most basic, which is CMV replication. And that just means that um, the doctors and nurses have been able to pick up evidence that the CMV virus is replicating in your blood or urine or wherever the sample is being collected for. With CMV replication, most patients may have absolutely no symptoms at all, um, and that's called CMV replication. If patients have CMV replication and they have some um, symptoms, often they can be very non-specific, flu-like symptoms, kind of feeling tired, muscle aches, maybe some fevers, then we call that CMV syndrome. And the next step beyond CMV syndrome will be CMV disease and that's where patients will have all of the above but also some evidence that the CMV is affecting or damaging some type of organ within the body and CMV can affect any part of your body but the commonest um, that we see uh, with regards to symptoms and signs in our patients is CMV in the gastrointestinal tract so that's um, signs of CMV infection causing some kind of harm anywhere from your mouth all the way down to your tail end. That's the commonest, but we do see um, patients often come in with symptoms and signs um, of, you know, of CMV disease affecting different organs as well. So how can you catch CMV? Because if you do Google it, it comes up as a herpes virus and people, I assume, will automatically assume it's sexually transmitted. Um, which doesn't look great, especially when I was 14 and had my transplant. So I think this is an important thing and it also is, you know, it's the danger of, kind of going to Google for all your answers. So, I mean, it is correct that um, CMV belongs to a family, which is called the herpes virus, but there are over 100 herpes virus in existence, of which about eight or so affect humans. Um, and as an example, the um, varicella zoster virus, which we often call the chickenpox virus, that's also a type of herpes virus. And so and CMV belongs to that family, but it's different from the herpes virus. And CMV can be caught in many, many ways. It can be caught um, from, from bodily fluids. And um, so, you know, intimate contact, yes, but also from coughs, sneezes, and sharing utensils, for example. And you can even get it from, from parent to, um, to baby, um, so mothers can pass it on to their children, that's congenital CMV. So there's lots of ways that it can be passed um, and you know, that's why so many people in, in the population will have had some kind of exposure to CMV. Could you explain why the immune system could 
maybe not be functioning as well for transplant patients? Yes, of course. So your, your immune system is designed to do a certain job and the job of your immune system is to fight and destroy anything that your immune system doesn't recognize as belonging to yourself. So it's designed to attack bugs, parasites, viruses, cancerous looking cells, um, and your immune system does a very effective job when it comes to that. The problem when it comes to transplantation is that if we've taken somebody else's organ, or you know, kidney for example, and put it into you, then your immune system will not know that that's, you know, uh, you know that kidney's been put in for a good thing. It will just instantly look at it and think, that's a foreign object, that's gonna cause me harm. I need to destroy that kidney. And that's what we call rejection. When your immune system looks at this foreign kidney and mounts a response to attack it and to try and destroy it. And therefore to try and stop your immune system from doing the job that it's designed to do, the only way that we can make transplantation successful and reduce the risk of rejection is to try and dampen down your immune system a little bit. And that's where the anti-rejection tablets or immune suppression, as they're also known, come into play. So what those tablets are designed to do is to reduce your risk of getting rejection of your transplanted organ. The caveat to that is that by weakening your immune system a little bit, we are putting you at slightly higher risk of certain infections and cancers. And when it comes to infections, you're at risk of getting any common infection, but also what we call opportunistic infections. So these are infections which for healthy adults with normal working immune systems, they very rarely cause a problem. But when your immune system is weak, either because it's been born like that, or you've acquired a problem that's made it like that, or you're taking tablets that make your immune system weaker, then those viruses, which are normally lying dormant, sleeping away, can use the opportunity of a weak immune system and try and cause some mischief. We'll look at a video which summarizes some of what we've already talked about with regards to the CMV virus. Cytomegalovirus overview. If a healthy individual is infected with cytomegalovirus or CMV, they generally show no symptoms. Their immune system keeps the virus under control and prevents it from multiplying and causing illness. However, in patients where the immune system has been weakened, for example in transplant patients who must take anti-rejection tablets to prevent their organ from being rejected, CMV can multiply as the immune system cannot bring the virus under control. If left untreated, the virus can multiply even further, leading to CMV infection and disease, which can affect many organs in the body such as the lungs, liver and kidney. CMV can be transmitted in various ways. It can be transmitted via organ transplantation, mother to baby, via blood, contact of bodily fluids, and coughing and sneezing. It is one of the most common viruses to cause severe infection in transplant patients. A person who has never been infected with CMV is referred to as CMV negative and someone who has been infected with the virus is referred to as CMV positive. Transplant patients who are at highest risk of developing CMV infection are those who are CMV negative and are receiving an organ from a donor who is CMV positive. If the patient is CMV positive and their donor is CMV positive, this places the patient at a moderate risk of developing CMV infection following their transplant. Patients are also at a moderate risk of CMV infection when they are CMV positive, but the organ donor is CMV negative. Finally, patients are at the lowest risk of developing CMV infection when they are CMV negative and their organ donor is also CMV negative. So how can CMV be prevented? So, I mean, there's standard hygienic ways that you can do it, you know, things which we are currently doing um, a lot more frequently, hand washing, cleaning things down. But in reality, from a transplant perspective, we normally have one of two strategies to try and reduce the risk of patients getting CMV. One of those is prophylaxis, and that's the commonest strategy, and that's where the transplant center will determine what risk that particular patient has of getting CMV 
Some of that relates to what that individual CMV status is and also the status of the donor kidney as well. And if you're deemed to be at perf medium or high risk, then you will be given an antiviral therapy to try and reduce the risk of you getting CMV for the first three months or six months after your transplant. Because the early period after your transplant is a time when your burden of immune suppression is, is at its highest. And that's probably the highest um, time for, for your risk of getting CMV. Fewer centers do a different strategy, which is called preemptive therapy. And that's where they will take routine tests to see if they are finding any evidence of CMV replication in your blood. And as soon as they do, they will then start you on a course of treatment. Both strategies are very good. Both work very well. And it very much just depends on what your center is used to as to what kind of strategy you will have. Is it possible to get CMV more than once? Unfortunately, it is possible to get CMV more than one time. For, for healthy adults, it's, it's rare. Once you get CMV, your immune system forms antibodies, it recognizes it, um, and normally the virus will, will lie dormant. But because you have antibodies to one strain, that does not mean that you have protection to all other strains, and therefore you could get CMV um, more than once. And that's more likely for, for transplant patients who again will also form antibodies, but they may not form sufficient level of antibodies or they may be exposed to other strains. And also for transplant patients, their, their journeys are a lot different from the general population. So if transplant patients were to get CMV, but later on um, over the course of their life, they were to suddenly get something like rejection, well then when you get rejection, that's a sign that your immune suppression needs to be bumped up a little bit and therefore by increasing your immune suppression we may treat your rejection but simultaneously we may be putting you a slightly higher risk of getting cmv reactivation so what are the symptoms of cmv infection and cmv disease and what are the differences so as we mentioned earlier and um, there's a whole range of symptoms. So for example, with CMV replication, where there's evidence that CMV virus um, is, is there, some patients may be completely asymptomatic, so have no symptoms at all. Some people with CMV um, syndrome will have evidence of replication, so we can find the virus there, and they will have some kind of what we call a prodromal illness, so flu-like illness, um, aches and pains, fevers, feeling tired, um, and the next step up from that is CMV disease, where patients may have all of the above, but also some evidence that the CMV infection is causing a problem in a particular organ. And CMV is what we often describe as a, as a real chameleon virus, because it can cause so many different variable effects. The CMV, if it causes CMV disease, it can affect your, your brain, can affect your eyes, your lungs, your bowels, your liver. And depending on which organ is being affected, those are the problems that we will see. So we often say to um, our trainees that are coming through and to all the staff that if a transplant patient does not look well, does not feel well, we always need to remember and, you know, on the bottom of our differential. So that's our kind of little list that we're trying to think, you know, what we think is going on. Like, could this be CMV? Because that's, that's the nature of CMV infection. And we'll have a look at the short video which summarizes some of what we've discussed. Cytomegalovirus symptoms. When the immune system is not working properly, CMV may start to multiply and can affect many organs in the body. CMV infection may present with no symptoms at all in some patients following a transplant and the only way it can be detected is generally through a blood or urine test. In other patients, CMV infection can present with common flu-like symptoms such as a sore throat, aching muscles, tiredness, a high temperature, skin rash or feeling sick. Patients who are diagnosed with CMV disease may experience some of the symptoms of CMV infection we have talked about so far. However, there will be evidence of CMV affecting a particular organ in their body. And so, in addition to detecting CMV in blood or urine, it can also be detected by a biopsy from the affected tissue. 
CMV disease can affect the lungs, causing pneumonia, which has symptoms of cough and shortness of breath. If CMV has affected the stomach and intestines, symptoms can include pain and difficulty swallowing, abdominal pain, nausea and diarrhea. If CMV disease affects the liver, symptoms of jaundice, including yellowing of the skin, abdominal pain and flu-like symptoms can present. In very rare cases, CMV disease may affect the brain, the spinal cord and the eyes. If CMV has affected the brain, it can cause sensitivity to light, seizures and weakness. In some instances, CMV disease can affect the transplanted organ, which increases the risk of the organ being rejected. Depending on your risk of developing CMV infection and the routine practice at your hospital, there are two different options to prevent CMV infection and disease following your transplant. The most common option is that you will be given medication to prevent CMV from multiplying in your body and you will start taking the medication on the day of your transplant or shortly after. Doctors call this type of CMV therapy CMV prophylaxis which is given to prevent the virus from multiplying in the first instance. Alternatively, your doctor may want to monitor you until he or she sees the virus multiplying and only when evidence of CMV infection is detected in your urine or blood will you be given CMV medication to prevent the virus from multiplying even more. Your doctor will refer to this second type of CMV therapy as preemptive therapy both options are effective ways of preventing CMV disease from developing. So how do you test for CMV? So this has been one of the real advantages for how um, things have evolved and now it's really easy for us to test for CMV and the commonest ways are usually to try and find it, evidence of CMV virus replication in bodily fluids, which is almost always blood and sometimes, for example, urine. Very rarely we will need to get a tissue diagnosis, so that means we need a biopsy of an affected organ um, to pick up um, evidence of CMV virus. And sometimes people may get, you know, our transplant patients will often get um, biopsies just like um, anyone else, and sometimes you know, people may be found to have CMV on the basis of that biopsy alone. But when we're suspicious of CMV, the first and usually the only thing that we really need to do is to check your blood to see if you have CMV. Do you feel someone should consider an organ if the donor is CMV positive? Absolutely. And the main reason for that is, as I've already mentioned, the majority of people in the UK have been exposed to CMV and as adults, and therefore the majority of people will be CMV positive. And while we are talking about the importance of CMV infection and disease after transplantation and some of the problems it can cause, CMV is now an easily detectable condition and it's an easily preventable and treatable condition. And the benefits of getting a kidney transplant, even if you are in that high risk category of the donor being CMV positive and you yourself as a patient being recipient CMV negative, the advantages of the kidney transplant if you're living with kidney failure versus being on dialysis are overwhelming. Will CMV affect a transplanted kidney? So I mentioned the CMV can affect any organ, but it, it's actually quite rare for it to affect the kidney. I'd say maybe less than 10% of cases will we see evidence of CMV nephritis, so infl you know, virus kind of causing inflammation in the kidney. CMVs, when it causes CMV disease, it's much more likely to cause well, gastrointestinal um, problems. So that's anywhere from, from your mouth to your tail end. Now that's from a direct point of view, but indirectly, yes, CMV could affect your transplant kidney because if you are unwell from CMV infection or CMV disease, if you're not eating and drinking very well and you're becoming a bit dry and dehydrated, or you're not able to take your tablets properly, then that can indirectly affect your transplant kidneys. Or if, as part of the treatment for CMV, as we'll go on to, part of the treatment is to think about whether we can lower your burden of immune suppression, and that obviously comes with a risk. We're lowering the burden of immune suppression to obviously try and help your body fight the CMV infection, but that comes with a risk that if we lower your immune suppression too much, 
it gives your immune system a chance to recognize that foreign kidney and cause you rejection. That just leads me to my next question, really. Does the risk of CMV change depending on the organ received? Yes, and um, different organs come with different um, risks. So, the you know, for example, certain types of transplants, such as lung transplantation, and our lung transplant colleagues have to use a higher level of immune suppression um, in the context of lung transplantation. And therefore, because the level of immune suppression is a lot higher, the risk of getting things like CMV is higher. And it also makes a difference with regards to you know, the um, level of, kind of CMV um, virus that can come with, with different organs. Obviously, as kidney transplant patients, uh, our patients may sometimes get other organs. Um, it's quite common to get a kidney with a pancreas transplant, for example. Um, if you have type 1 diabetes, it's the cause of your kidney failure. And for in those circumstances, we often do have to use a slightly higher level of immune suppression. And therefore, the risk of CMV will be a little higher. So different organs do come with different risks. Um, and a lot of that risk depends on how much anti-rejection therapy that individual needs. So first, tell me, how old were you when you were first diagnosed with CMV? So I first realized that I had CMV around the age of 14 when I received my father's kidney. Um, it was within the first year of transplantation. And can you remember at that time what, what symptoms you had? Um, so I was very sluggish, kind of very tired, kind of felt slow in mind and body. Um, so yeah, I guess those were the main things. I was very sleepy as well, like I would take midday naps quite frequently. And how does that compare to the CMV episode that you had last year? It was similar in the sense that I still had the sluggishness this time round or last year. Um, but also this time um, I had uncontrollable bowel movements, um, which weren't pleasant. Um, so yeah, I was frequenting the toilet. Fortunately, I guess the silver lining of COVID being that I was isolating anyway. So I was always close to a bathroom. Um, so I guess in some senses, COVID kind of worked for me in that sense. Okay, and I think you've described it really nicely, the difference between what probably was CMV syndrome for the first way you described it and CMV disease the second time where it's clearly affected your, your bowels and possibly causing some colitis. And so can you remember how you were managed for CMV both times? And can you tell me a little bit about your experience with both? Sure. So the first time, as mentioned, I was about 14, maybe 15. Um, so I was still in paediatrics at that point. Um, I was treated with IV medication, um, so intravenous medication, um, and I was isolated into a cubicle um, and only one nurse was allowed in and I wasn't really allowed any visitors. So my mom um, decided she was going to stay with me. Um, the whole treatment in the hall lasted approximately a month. So my mom basically kind of lived with me on the pediatric ward for like a month. Um, so that was very kind of cabin feverish because you're in this like small little cubicle um, for a whole month. And at that age as well, you kind of want to go out and do stuff and live your life. Okay, and I think you've touched upon this a little bit already, but I mean, from a from a day to day basis, kind of how did CMV affect you? Um, so yeah, as mentioned, very sluggish, kind of tired, um, sleeping a lot, a lot more than I usually would. Um, also the mental aspect of missing a lot of schooling and not being able to do my GCSEs properly when I was younger. Um, I had a mental effect and also in turn affected my results. Um, and this time round, even though I wasn't in hospital um, due to COVID, I was isolating anyway. Um, so when I was 14, I was isolating in hospital, but this time around, I was isolating in my house. So both times, it's kind of felt very cabin feverish um, in the fact that I've had to stay inside um, for different reasons, of course. Um, but yeah, it's not been pleasant. Um, and this time around with the bowel movement issues um, and change of color and things, um, that wasn't very fun either. Um, I was missing a lot of sleep that 
I would usually get at night um, because I needed to repeatedly go to the bathroom. Um, so yeah, it's not been fun, but um, it did pass, thankfully, no pun intended. <laughs> How did CMV kind of infection impact you as a transplant patient during the pandemic? You, I mean, you mentioned obviously the isolating at home, but with regards to um, how you were looked after and your follow-up, how uh, how was it during the pandemic? I was isolating anyway because of COVID though this time, but I did have the freedom of moving around my own house. So that was handy as opposed to just one box room. Um, and it was treated mainly by tablets um, this time round. And my consultations were mainly done on the phone. Um, unless I had to go in for a blood test, which I had to physically go in then. Um, most things were done by phone. Um, so appointments that didn't require blood tests and were just kind of catch ups of how I was feeling, how I'm doing um, and discussing blood results from bloods that I had been given um, were all done via the phone. Again, I guess the silver lining for me was because I had more bowel issues. Um, being at home was kind of handy um, because there was always a toilet nearby. So silver lining, I guess. Um, but generally, again, the whole kind of staying in and kind of watching the outside world through a TV or through your window or whatever it might be um, was and still is to some degree quite frustrating and it, just, I guess, people generally miss human contact. Um, and I guess when you're immune suppressed or had a new transplant or have an illness where you have to kind of shield or isolate or whatever the condition may be, um, I think it does mentally change a person, um, whether they realize it or not. Um, so I now have this kind of anxiety of what's the world going to be like when I properly enter it again? Like, are all the protocols going to be the same? Like, am I allowed to shake hands? Should I not? Um, will people find that rude if I did or didn't? So we discussed earlier some of the CMV prevention strategies, either using prophylaxis or preemptive therapies, and that often includes the use of antiviral therapies which, which target CMV. When it comes to CMV management, when we have to treat people who have evidence of CMV replication, we're often using the same antiviral therapies at slightly bigger doses, and there's a whole other range of antiviral therapies as well. What are the side effects of the CMV antiviral therapy? We have a range of um, CMV antiviral therapies, but the, the commonest one that we use as first-line therapy, perhaps its most common side effect is that it can cause bone marrow suppression. So your bone marrow helps to produce white blood cells that fight infection, red blood cells to raise your um, blood level, and also platelets that kind of helps keep your blood sticky if you have cuts and bruises. And the Irony is that seeing the infection itself can also cause bone marrow suppression. So if we do see evidence of bone marrow suppression, sometimes it's a chicken and egg situation where we're trying to work out whether it's the CMV infection itself that's causing it or whether it's the antiviral therapy. That's the common side effect. There are other side effects and um, gastrointestinal effects, nausea, bloatedness, um, which are quite common with, with many medications. And the different antivirals will have their own specific ones. Some of the second, third line therapies that we use can sometimes affect the kidneys. Fortunately, they're rarely used because our frontline antiviral therapies are usually very, very effective. Do the drugs for a kidney transplant change if you do get CMV? So, there's, there's lots of things for us as transplant doctors to think about when it comes to um, your kidney transplant drugs, so your immune suppression, your anti-rejection tablets. On the one hand, if you do have CMV infection, apart from the antivirals that we want to give you to treat it, another strategy which often happens, goes kind of hand in glove with giving you antiviral tablets, is to lower your immune suppression burden a little bit. Because from our perspective, if one of our transplant patients has developed an opportunistic infection, such as CMV, then that's a sign that the 
it means the pressure that you've been receiving up until then is perhaps a bit too much and therefore that's a it's a sign for us to lower your immune suppression a little bit at the same time as we try and treat your CMD. So there may be some changes to your anti-rejection tablets on the basis of that, which is a, a kind of a management technique. Another reason why your anti-rejection tablets may change is I mentioned the, um, the bone marrow suppression that can come either with CMV infection or with the antivirals that we use to manage the CMV. Some of your anti-rejection tablets can also cause bone marrow suppression. So sometimes there may be some changes required with regards to balancing the, the side effects from the infection or treatment and the potential side effects from your anti-rejection tablets. Is it still possible to get CMV infection whilst on CMV antiviral therapies? And if so, is it treatable still? So for patients who need the prophylaxis, so um, CMV antivirals to prevent them from getting CMV if they've been deemed to be in a high risk group, it would be very unusual for them to get CMV if they were taking the right dose and they were taking the tablet in the right way. Sometimes there may be problems with patients taking tablets or they may have forgotten to take some tablets and therefore there could be a risk of seeing evidence of CMV infection. But the commonest antiviral therapy that we use both for prevention and treatment of CMV infection, the dose needs to be adjusted depending on how well your kidney function works. So again, it's important for us as transplant doctors and nurses looking after patients to be vigilant about the need to adjust the dose of that antiviral therapy. So therefore, if people are being underdosed, there would be a risk of them getting CMV infection despite being in that prophylactic period. Vice versa, if people were on too high a dose because their kidney function is a little bit lower compared to what it was earlier after the transplant, there's a risk of getting side effects and possible complications from the therapy. So it's very important that we keep a very close eye on patients and that's the reason why you'll find that your level of surveillance after you get diagnosed with CMV infection goes up because the doctors want to make sure that you are well, that your transplant's working well, and just to keep an eye on not just your kidney function, but looking out for some of the side effects associated with the infection itself, but also the treatment. Is CMV still treatable even if I have finished a course of um, medications for CMV? Absolutely. If um, people have finished a uh, prophylaxis course um, of the antiviral therapy in their first three months or six months, if they were to show signs of CMV after that and the high risk period probably will be when they stop their prophylaxis, then often that same antiviral therapy will be used at a, at a slightly higher dose because the treatment dose is different from the prophylaxis dose. The other thing that would happen if you had evidence of CMV infection would be a lowering of your immune suppression and that would go hand in hand with the CMV antiviral therapy. So why can't my doctor just keep me on CMV antiviral medication for longer, especially if I'm already high risk category? Yeah, the antiviral therapies that we use um, do come with their own potential side effects and complications. And I think it's just balancing the risks and benefits and um, with regards to that. The reason why it's only given for the first three months or the first six months after your transplant, depending on what your risk category is, is because those early months are when your burden of immune suppression as a transplant patient is at its highest. It's also the period of time when your risk for rejection is usually at its highest. Once you go beyond those first three months or six months and your level of immune suppression is a lot lower at three months or six months if you've not had any rejection compared to what it's like in the first day after your transplant surgery, the balance um, of risk versus benefit would suggest that stopping your antiviral therapies and reducing the risk of getting side effects and complications from that is the best strategy because the chance of getting CMV are not completely diminished but they are a lot lower. So first, do you think um, there are any other questions that you think may be helpful to patients going through a transplant with regards to CMV? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So during COVID, how has the management of treatment um, changed for transplant patients? 
Well, I mean, with regards to CMV, um, it's, you know, it's been difficult, obviously, with people, you know, patients having to shield at home um, and during the, the big surges, um, you know, we've had to try to reduce the, the number of face-to-face -face interactions that we've done and, and review more people remotely, either by telephone or video. But for people who had CMV um, syndrome or CMV disease, those were the ones who were prioritised for face-to-face -face interactions. It's balancing that risk between you know, needing to see them face to face and you know, needing to bring people to you know what would be considered a kind of a higher risk environment. Um, and obviously, you know, with regards to the pandemic and um, you know the reduced frequency of face to face interaction and the shielding that's been needed, you know, for a lot of patients, that's you know that's been quite difficult with regards to their kind of mental health. Um, and also kind of other um, factors such as you know weight gain or reduced physical activity and um, which you know those kind of um, issues are really important for you know the long-term well-being of transplant patients you know beyond um, you know complications such as CMV um, and I think managing those have been quite difficult during the pandemic with with less face-to-face -face interactions which fortunately and um, now is back to being the the mainstay of our uh, clinic reviews. Are there patients who have faced major problems with CMV? And if so, what are those problems or complications? And also, can CMV be fatal? So CMV can be fatal, but fortunately that's now rather rare compared to a few decades ago. And that is mainly because of the increased awareness we have as um, transplant clinicians and the better methods of detection, prevention and management. The majority of people um, after a transplant who get CMV may either be asymptomatic or they may just have some mild symptoms um, of CMV syndrome and often you know, that's um, as much as they will get and they will then get successfully treated. That's not to say that some patients may not get um, CMV disease and sometimes in some cases you know, that can be quite, um, quite a major complication so patients can sometimes get very severe and CMV pneumonitis, for example, where you know, the virus affects their lungs um, and they may become quite unwell with that. So for some patients, very rarely, they will be hospitalized with CMV. And it is very rare to die from it, but um, we, you know, we do see it because you know, we do transplant you know, thousands of patients every year. But fortunately, it's a lot rarer compared to what it used to be like a few decades ago. What do you think are the most important things um, a patient should remember who has just had a transplant or is about to have a transplant regarding CMV? So I think the most important thing to remember is that CMV is now easily detectable, it's preventable and it's treatable. And, and whether what your risk of getting CMV depending on what the uh, status of CMV is in yourself or your donor, that should not really influence your decision with regards to taking the kidney because in pretty much most circumstances, a, a, a kidney transplant will be a better option than remain on dialysis. The most important thing is that even though immune suppression is probably the cause of complications such as CMV, the only way transplantation is successful is because of that immune suppression. And it's critical that our transplant patients take that immune suppression and they take it as prescribed on a regular basis and therefore if there's any issues which mean they can't take their immune suppression either because they are they've run out or they are vomiting and they're not able to keep it down then those are the circumstances when you need to let your transplant team know because the most critical thing for us to, and our patients is to ensure that you are taking your immune suppression exactly as prescribed the other important thing is to ensure that we have you on the right surveillance um, pattern after your transplant. You'll be seen very frequently for the first few months after your transplant. But then beyond um, that early period, the number of visits drops down quite significantly. And But that's a very dynamic process and it really just depends on how well you are and at what stage you are after your transplant. The important thing is that outside of those surveillance visits, if you feel unwell, you need to always have a little chat either with your local um, healthcare practitioners at your GP surgery or contact the transplant team um, if you can because when you are unwell often it may just be something simple a viral infection cough or cold but as a transplant patient we should always be aware uh, have that differential that could this be something else 
and could this be something like CV and CMV? And it's very important that you raise your concerns so that a responsible healthcare professional can look at that and either rule it out or if you do have CMV to pick it up early and, and treat it early. So from our perspective, this has been a really interesting discussion on CMV and I'd really like to thank Fez um, for explaining his story and his experiences and being very open um, about those experiences. There are complications associated with um, transplantation. CMV is one of those, but there are many others, but we are very good at now picking up CMV um, and treating CMV. I recently just attended a conference where there were lots of sessions on CMV and looking at some of the further kind of advances in uh, detection and prevention and management that are still being actively researched and therefore the purpose of this video is really just going to make you aware of the importance of CMV, also to reassure you that it's no longer the fatal complication as it was before.